Life Law 2. You create your own experience. This life is worth living, we can say, since it is what we make it. William James. Why should you read this life law? To solve the mystery of why your role in this life is what it is, get the tools to set it up differently by changing the statement you make to the world in everything you do. Tony was bigger and stronger than most people in our class, and he loved acting macho. He wouldn't just walk up to a group. He'd flex and pose as he came towards you. Then he'd grab you and brag about how strong and tough he was. He obviously did this because it was the one thing that he felt distinguished himself in a crowd. He thought it impressed people, when in fact, everyone just rolled their eyes and mimicked him behind his back. Lindsay was just as bad. When you would talk with her, she was incredibly nice, but it didn't take long to realize that she was the world's worst gossip. She wouldn't just pass on the truth. She would make stuff up as she went along. She was horrible, and two weeks into the year, nobody would even come near her. Why, instead of growing in popularity, did Tony and Lindsay each become more and more of a loser? Because they refused to pay attention to the way they created their own experience. Or to put it another way, they did nothing to change the way people experience them. I'm using obvious examples to make a point. The point is that you control the way the world responds to you by the way you conduct yourself. When I talk about you creating your own experience, I'm talking about the statement you make to the world through your attitude and appearance and the world's response to you. As you progress in this book and start to formulate your strategy for a better life, you have to keep asking yourself how you are currently creating your own experience. Have you created your experience in a way that works for you or does it not work for you? If you look and act like a dumbass, you will be treated like one. What you're about to learn is that your entire experience in the world is determined solely by how you engage the world. The way everyone reacts to you, from friends to parents to strangers, is due to the way you present yourself. It's due to the way you create your self-image. The good news is that you decide which role you want to play, and thus you decide which response you want to receive from the world. You decide because you choose the behaviors that put you in each of these roles. You choose how you dress, how you talk, what kind of friends you have, who you date, where you hang out, whether or not you respect your elders, whether or not you break the law, whether or not you do drugs or drink, what kind of friends you are, what kind of work ethic you have, whether your word is good or not, whether you are a giver or a taker. As you can see, You choose your behavior. I'm not trying to preach to you and tell you that you should or shouldn't dress in a certain way or you should or shouldn't do drugs. All I'm saying is that you must be responsible for the reaction that comes with your choice. If you're a loner, it's because you set it up that way. If you're in constant conflict with authority, it's because you set it up that way. If you don't like the way everybody is reacting to you, you set it up that way by the way you engage the world. The good news is that you can choose to change that. You can choose to act differently and present yourself differently, and you will get a different response. If you don't like something, change it. If you can't change it, change your attitude. Don't complain. Maya Angelou. The roles we play. Here's the most important question for you to answer. What is the role you tend to play when you engage the world? All of us play some sort of role Some of us are jocks or drama mamas. Others of us are brainiacs. Some of us play the goth role, all dressed in black. And others of us play the preppy role, all dressed in Abercrombie and Fitch. The role we play sends out a message. It teaches people to respond to you a certain way. As unfortunate and unfair as it is, people will often stereotype you, placing you in a certain role. And thus, they will always have a fixed response to you. As you go through this chapter, I want you to start asking yourself some questions about the role you play and how that is creating your experience. Here are some to begin with. Number one, stand in a mirror and study your clothes, your hair, and your posture. What do you think your appearance, your look, is saying to others? Number two, think about the way you meet strangers. How do you speak to them? What do you think is the initial impression you make on them? Number three, 
How do you talk to your parents? Do you make rebellious statements? Or are you a willing spirit? Number four, what is your personality like around other students? Are you a giver or a taker? Are you warm or distant? What kind of integrity do you think you convey to others? Are you sincere or are you a gossip? Are you a good friend or are you a backstabber? With that information in hand, it's time for you to take a good look at the roles you play in life and decide if those roles are getting you the treatment that you want. Listed below are many of the roles that you probably see at your school. Do you see yourself in any of them? Is the experience that you're creating working for you? Allowing you to engage the world with honesty and integrity? Or are you operating off the worst parts of yourself? Hiding your true feelings with false roles? Are you using your roles to share yourself fully? Or are you using your roles to protect yourself from potential hurt? Goody two-shoes. You just want to tell these people to give it a rest. They have to do everything more than right and in doing so, make everyone else look like a slacker. Don't confuse the goody two-shoes with someone who's genuinely moral. They are always five minutes early for class and never forget their homework. They bring clean folded gym clothes every day of the week. Prom queen. This girl is a social butterfly. In her eyes, life is nothing but a popularity contest. Everybody is her best friend when she needs something. She is artificial and as NutraSweet. Tease. This girl flirts with every guy in school, but squirms at the thought of even holding hands. Look for the girls hanging out about halfway to first base. This girl's goal in life is to lead people on. Jock. For these people, class is just time to rest up for their next game. Jocks don't have friends, they only have teammates. If you see them carrying books, I'll bet you they're just playbooks. The whiner. These people are always complaining about something, and it's never their fault. They make country music sound peppy. They always think they're the victim. Drama Mama. You thought only ER was tragic. Nothing, and I mean nothing, is ordinary to these people. Everything is always the best or worst, or the nicest or meanest thing that's ever been done. Everything they say is discounted as exaggeration. Teacher's Pet. This is a moron who ruins your opportunity to leave class five minutes early by asking 10 minutes of questions about nothing. They always sit in the front row for class and can be found clapping chalkboard erasers after class. They never miss an opportunity to raise their hand. Gossip. These people are absolutely insufferable. They always have some information, usually misinformation, about something. Never trust them because if they will do it to you, they will do it to you as well. They are always whispering to someone, their new best friend. Most of all, other things they say are neither made up or highly sensationalized stories about others. Slacker. Don't look for these people in the library. Unless a remote control and bag of potato chips are involved, the slacker is not interested. A slacker's best role is Bart Simpson. Alarm clock, no way. Perfecto. These people invented the locker organizer. With them, everything has to be in perfect order. Something is always wrong in these people's lives. When they make a 99 on a test, they will fight for two days for the last point. Enough already. Druggies. You will find these people in the lunchroom at lunchtime with the munchies, if you know what I mean. They are always thinking about getting high. These people know more about side effects than a pharmacist. Keep in mind, a dime carries a whole other meaning with these people. Granola. These people look like they've been on Survivor Island all semester. They would wear a potato sack, even if it meant the school dress code. They own no shampoo and even less soap. Their wardrobe is as boring as economic class. The Glamour Puss. This is a girl who comes to school with the four hour hairdo, looking like she put her makeup on with a paintbrush. Everything, and I do mean everything, hair, makeup, and clothes, has to be absolutely perfect at all times. If the building is on fire, her only concern is how she looks in the lighting. What you see is all you get. You can identify a glamour post because she is posing for an imaginary cameraman.
brainiacs. These are the people who are so smart they will read the Odyssey in Greek, just in case something was lost in translation. Unlike Perfecto, they make a hundred on the test. The idea of relaxing weekend to these guys is to just to do some advanced trigonometry. Greasers. These guys would rather work on their cars than drive them. But never forget, they don't have cars, they have hot rods. The glamour puss and prom queen frequently use the greaser's hood for a mirror. When you talk to these guys, it's like speaking another language. They list car parts like doctors list body parts. If they ever do let you in their hot rod, they will make you take your shoes off before you get in. Pig pens. I've met horses that smell better than these people. They're just flat out filthy. They will use their pencil lead to get the dirt out from under their fingernails in class. These guys' idea of art is their booger collection on their bedroom wall. Minions. Minions will never say no. They are always doing what someone else says they should do. A minion will never ever have an original thought. Minions are constantly doing something for somebody else. Marilyn Mansons. These people are always dressed for a funeral, even when nobody has died. These guys don't buy necklaces, they buy collars. Come on guys, lose the black nail polish. Taking accountability for your life. I probably don't have to tell you that if you stay stuck in these roles, pretending to be something you are not, you are creating an experience for yourself that is never going to provide any real success. And it's easy, real easy, to get stuck in these roles. The question is whether the roles you are choosing are creating the experience you really want out of life. Let me tell you what happened to me when I was 16 years old. I was a starting point guard for my high school basketball team, the Green Hill Hornets, and I felt on top of the world. It was early December, and we were on our way to what many predicted was a championship season. Parents and classmates poured into the stands to watch us. My heart pounded with pride each time my name was called during the player introductions prior to the game. We were invited to a mid-season tournament consisting of all the powerhouses of the city, and I was pumped. As I took the court for that first game, I was hit with a wave of excitement. We were going to win. I could just feel it. Then, 30 seconds into the tournament, I passed the ball to the wing, broke to the basket, and got an instantaneous pass back. I drove left and had my man beat. I planned my left foot to cut behind him, and it happened. My life changed in less than a second. I lay screaming in a heap on the floor, screaming in pain and holding my knee as my foot flopped from one side to the other. All I wanted at that point was for someone to hold my foot still so maybe the pain would stop. But the pain wouldn't stop. My dad and my coach had to help me off the court and into the locker room. For me, the game was over. The tournament was over. The season was over. It was surreal that I could be driving the lane one minute and being driven to the hospital the next. The doctor on call gave me one quick look. No exam was necessary. Not wanting to be the one who told me, he pulled my dad aside, but I could still hear the doctor talking under his breath. Pain still on fire in my leg. I made out seven words that hurt nearly as much as the injury itself. It's bad. He may not play again. And it was bad. I had torn ligaments in my knee and couldn't even walk without crutches. I spent two weeks in a funk because this was a huge deal to me. Everybody has one thing that defines them in life, and for me, my passion was basketball. Being a basketball player was something I had been working for since the fifth grade. Attending summer basketball camps, playing in YMCA leagues, working endless hours on my fundamentals in the driveway with my dad. This was the experience I had created for myself, the role I had carved out in school and in life. When I made the high school varsity basketball team, I was living my dream, and in a split second, it was gone. I couldn't believe life had dealt me such a blow. It was so unfair, so cruel. I would limp around school, grimacing as I moved from classroom to classroom on my crutches, always glancing up to make sure that people were giving me the proper sympathetic looks. After my injury, I created a new experience for myself. I began to play the role of the whiner. It was an easy role to take on, in large part because it kept me from having to deal with the huge question that lay in front of me. So what are you going to be now? You know, my dad said, no one's going to feel sorry for you for very long. 
I absolutely hate what's happened to you, but that doesn't change the fact that you're going to have to create a new role, a new plan, and get yourself back up and going again. Oh no, I thought. I looked for the nearest door. This was not the time to hear another speech from the old man. I'm not asking anyone to feel sorry for me, I said defensively. Sure you are, he said. Look at you. You wake up every day, making sighs, and doing the poor, pitiful me act. How long do you think it's going to work? What are you talking about? Jay, what are you accomplishing having people feel sorry for you? How are you helping yourself by getting on the phone every night and telling your friends how fate dealt you a bad hand the other night at the basketball game? Have you noticed the coach has already got another player to take your place? Man, was he bugging me with all the accountability crap. Hey, I said, I, can't I be disappointed that my knee is totally screwed up? Yes, but that doesn't mean that you can't do anything about it. You might not be able to control everything that happens to you, but you can control what you do about it. Here we go, I thought. How about coming up with a strategy to rehabilitate your leg so you can get in a position to walk again? And then maybe play basketball again, Dad said. A strategy. This wasn't a chess game we were talking about. I haven't seen any sign that you're doing a thing except bitching and moaning, he said. Do you know that feeling you get when your parent makes you mad? The feeling that you want to pack up all your stuff and move to India. Meanwhile, Dad kept bearing in. How long do you want to play this role, the role of the whiner? I was furious at him for the way he was jacking with me. But whining wasn't getting me back in shape, so I decided I would formulate a strategy. I got on a stationary bicycle and began pedaling it backward at about one mile an hour because I didn't have enough strength to go forward. I did it for weeks, feeling as if no progress was being made whatsoever. I did it as the basketball team finished its season. I did it without any applause. I did it without any cheers from the crowd. I did it just for me because I knew that was the only one who cared. Nobody else even knew how miserable I was. Press on. Nothing in the world can take the place of a perspective. Persistence. Ray A. Kroc. But you know what? Once the commitment began, once I started holding myself accountable, my circumstances did change. After several weeks, I was able to pedal forward on the bicycle. Then I was able to walk without a limp. I stuck with the program, and before long, I was able to lift weights. That enabled me to jog and run. Then two weeks before I was supposed to even look at a basketball, I sneaked out to my backyard, and while no one was looking, I picked up my basketball and took that layup I was going for when I blew out my knee the first time. I was back. It had all paid off, and before too long, I was on the basketball court shooting hoops with my friends. Finally, the next season rolled around, and on a late autumn afternoon, less than a year after my knee injury, my name was called to the public address system as Green Hill's starting guard. Because of what I did, I didn't get my name in Sports Illustrated. I didn't get a medal. I didn't get a certificate. I didn't even get a cookie. No news crew showed up for my return. In fact, as far as the big picture of my life goes, my high school basketball career means very little. But what will always remain important for me about all of this is that I realized I did not have to let a certain set of circumstances control me. I was able to come back from what I perceived at the time was a disastrous situation and create the circumstances to make me feel good about myself again. I had the option of sitting on the couch complaining, which would make me no happier, or getting out and doing something about my problem. So I went out and created a better circumstance for myself. Those small steps, which at the beginning of my commitment seemed like light years from the full contact basketball, accumulated into meaningful results. I could have laid around and made a decision to complain about the circumstances I found myself in. I could have said that I was the victim of a bad experience, but instead I went out and created a new experience for myself. You can do the same thing. You can do it right now by taking small steps. If you're sitting at home with 100 pounds to lose, or a D average, or a bad relationship with your parents, you can start taking steps out of these situations. Understand, though, that, whatever, that whether you like it or not, you are creating your own experience. The only choice you have is whether you're creating a good experience or a bad experience. 
light bulbs. You choose the statement you make to the world with your attitude and appearance. When you choose that statement, you choose how the world will respond to you. If you don't like the way people treat you, you can change that by changing the statement you make to them. What role do you play? Is it getting you the results that you want? You and you alone are responsible for the experiences you have in life.